Rich Verma, a senior fellow here at the center, who uh, has worked out uh, the scheduling of this event very effectively. Um, Rich has most recently served as the Assistant Secretary of State for Legislative Affairs, where he was a principal advisor to Secretary of State Clinton. He is a uh, officer, a veteran of the United States Air Force, uh, and he's been working on South Asia issues for well over a decade, and he will moderate this event. And so now, um, I would like to ask our guests to come to the stage, um, and I'd like all of us to welcome them as they do. Thank you uh, very much. <clears throat> we were told that it would be hard to generate a crowd on a Friday afternoon to talk about India. Uh, and I'm glad that we, uh, we were able to dispel that, that myth. But let me thank Rudy and, and Nira and John Podesta and Michael Wirtz in particular for making uh, this event not just a possibility but a priority. And I do look forward, uh, along with others at the center for other uh, events later in the year on India and South Asia and related topics over the, over the coming month. But I do know why this crowd is here, and they are here because of the, the two guests that we have. And, and we really are so fortunate and grateful to have such senior and experienced diplomats here with us. And we won't have time to go through your whole bios, but I, um, I hope you don't mind if I'll just hit the, hit the high points. Um, Ambassador Rao entered the Foreign Service at the age of 22, and since that time has been a trailbla trailblazer within the Indian diplomatic corps. In fact, uh, the word trailblazer is appropriate for both of our guests because there are so many firsts in their careers, and they both have broke through many uh, glass ceilings that a former boss of mine liked to uh, talk about. Um, she has been the ambassador from India to Sri Lanka, Peru, Bolivia, and of course China. She was the Foreign Secretary of India and now serves as the Indian Ambassador to the United States. And while she's only been in this job for about nine months, uh, her impact has been felt widely and uh, is generally regarded as one, as one of the city's most effective and informed ambassadors. Ambassador Powell and I had the pleasure of working together at the State Department, and it doesn't take long for one to appreciate uh, just how well regarded and respected Ambassador Powell is across the department and at all levels. And when she talks, uh, people listen, and for good reason, because like Ambassador Rao, uh, Nancy Powell has amassed an amazing diplomatic uh, record, also a four-time ambassador, uh, Uganda, Ghana, Pakistan, and Nepal, uh, former council general and political counselor in India, and most recently, serving as the State Department's Director General of the Foreign Service, one of the most senior positions in all of the State Department, and now appointed by President Obama as America's Ambassador to India. Although I would note, Nancy, in your bio that uh, you were the Acting Assistant Secretary of Legislative Affairs at the State Department, which is a, a special, <laughs> a special place in my heart, and I'm sure that was your springboard to many successes. Um, <laughs> So we do have a lot of ground to cover and unfortunately very little time. Uh, if it's okay with both of you, we'll take, uh, do some questions up here at the stage and then try to turn it over to, to some of your questions. Um, but Ambassador Powell, maybe I could start with you. Um, and maybe you could just give us a brief overview of your first uh, two months, even less than two months, as you settled into the new job, uh, how things have changed since you were there last in an official capacity. And as you look forward to next week at the strategic dialogue, uh, why this forum is important to the relationship. I reflect uh, every once in a while as I read the press, both in the United States and in India, they keep talking about this lull and this dip in our relations. And I keep thinking they clearly haven't looked at my calendar for the last six <laughs> weeks or the next six weeks. Um, it is an incredible array of activities that we are engaged with in India, and so much broader, so much deeper than when I was there. I left in 1995 as a political counselor. Uh, we were beginning at that point to go into new fields, but it is much, much broader now. Uh, in the six weeks that I've been in India, we've had two cabinet members. We have a third one coming at the end of this month. We've had two congressional delegations. 
We've had two very senior interagency groups that are there to brief on Afghanistan and on uh, the energies, the global energy situation. So an incredible array of activities in addition to all of the things that the embassy and its four consulates are doing. I've had the opportunity, I wanted to visit each of the four consulates before I came back uh, for the strategic dialogue. Um, I have been impressed with the changes. Uh, I told someone I arrived in Hyderabad and thought maybe I got on the wrong plane because it didn't look like the Hyderabad I remembered from 1994. Uh, the infrastructure changes, the incredible construction that has gone on in terms of business, uh, particularly in Chennai and Hyderabad in the IT field the increase in our trade from not about $9 billion when I left in 1995 to nearly $100 billion now, investment coming this way as well as going into India. So a huge change uh, in those 16 years, 17 years. But I would also say looking forward to next week, um, when I first started looking at India coming back ready, doing my consultations, and they told me there were 23 to 25 dialogues. It depended on how you counted. I have to admit that my initial reaction was a little bit of skepticism as to whether this was really a good idea. Um, as I prepared and as I've listened to the various uh, presentations by the embassy team and those who are working in the government in, of India on these dialogues, um, I am increasingly convinced of the true value of this. Um, there is, a, as a result of the annual meetings with the Secretary of State and the Foreign Minister, a setting of priorities, an accountability check to see how we've done, both of which are very important. At the other end, there are people who are sitting down and talking to each other and creating ideas, um, watching the sparks come off of scientists or people who are dealing with climate who are looking at uh, inoculation programs um, has been quite heartening in just six weeks to watch the kinds of things that they are doing both in terms of implementation but also of suggesting new ideas for the dialogue. So I'm quite enthusiastic about it. That's great. Thank you. Ambassador Rao, I guess the same question, but could you, I guess, go back on your first nine months here in Washington and maybe discuss any um, surprises or highs, lows, setbacks? How, how would you characterize the first nine months? And also the same question about the dialogue and what you think it means to the relationship. Thank you. And I wanted to say that when I look back at the last nine months, I tend to connect them with the preceding period of two years when I was involved with the relationship and uh, visited Washington on a number of occasions. And we saw the launch of the strategic dialogue, in fact, in, in the summer of 2010. Uh, we saw the visits of Prime Minister Manmohan Singh to, India, uh, to the United States. And we saw President Obama make a state visit to India in November of 2010. So all these uh, high points in the relationship have created a certain momentum a certain dynamism and energy about the, the relationship. So that's uh, what I came into when I arrived here in September of 2011. And a month thereafter, we had the first uh, higher education summit between India and the United States. And we had a very impressive delegation of educationists and academics led by our Minister of Human Resource Development come to Washington. And uh, this summit was co-chaired with Secretary Clinton. And it yielded a great deal of dividends about the way forward in higher education cooperation between the two countries. And that, to my mind, um, underpins uh, the, the uh, substance in many senses of the dialogue between our two countries today. Because as Ambassador Powell just pointed out, the, the number and the extent of the dialogue mechanisms that sustain the relationship today are really focused on almost every field of human endeavor. And they affect the lives of people on the ground. So there is a specific development-oriented focus that this strategic dialogue is beginning to acquire and indeed has acquired in, in the recent past. So when they ask me about what is the next strategic dialogue, which you know we will see happening in a few days from now, what is it going to focus on? And to my mind, it is this people aspect of cooperation between the two countries that I think needs to be emphasized and is being emphasized. So this focus on development, this focus on progress, prosperity, and people 
because people underpin this relationship. And um, we've, uh, we've had a certain, let's say, a momentum, and the relationship is certainly not oversold in my view. Uh, there is a certain logic, a certain rationale for close partnership between India and the United States. And that is recognized uh, not only here, but also in India, where there is a multi-partisan consensus about the need to progress this relationship forward. Mm -hmm. yeah, appreciate those uh, responses from both of you. And you both touched on, though, what I think you know the think tank community in Washington and experts in Washington and Delhi like to talk about and, frankly, like to lament about, which is <laughs> the state of the relationship and this notion that it has either been overhyped or oversold and that it is in decline or at least a state of malaise has uh, kind of permeated the, the relationship. And the critics would say that the dialogues are merely space fillers until we can figure out where we can move forward. <laughs> How, how, would you, how would you answer the, the critics? Do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been, uh, I have conscientiously objected to these <laughs> formulae or these approaches or these you know, analyses about the relationship because uh, you know, I deal uh, with it on an everyday basis. Um, you know, I uh, look at it at the ground level and I see the extent and the depth and substance of the kind of dialogue and cooperation that is happening between the two countries. You know, just look at the, uh, the way we are engaged in such a useful um, interaction on the situation in the region, for instance. Uh, let us look at how we are cooperating on maritime security. Let us uh, look at how trade and business, as Ambassador Powell just mentioned, have expanded between the two countries, the two-way flow of investments. Um, the cooperation between scientists and academics uh, on clean energy, on, uh, on renewable sources of energy, uh, the, the focus on um, cooperation on monsoon prediction. These are all very tangible, very palpable uh, areas of cooperation. They don't exist in some uh, you know, stratosphere. They are really affecting lives of people, as I said. So I would say that that this relationship is certainly, it's not being, uh, it's not in a situation or a place where we are just engaged in, in meaningless, you know, conversation or just, a, just an empty bandying of words or concepts. Uh, they, there is really tangible progress that has been recorded and has been achieved in my view. Ambassador Powell, maybe I could press you on that just a little bit. Uh, because I think there was a sense that when this administration came in that the U.S. and India might be kind of marching lock, lockstep uh, globally, putting out fires on human rights, on autocrats, on um, kind of instability, um, and joining hands to protect this kind of liberal democratic order. But we've seen resistance uh, when it comes to big issues on Libya or Syria or Iran. Would you accept that thesis? And if you, I guess, how would you frame it from that perspective, from a foreign policy perspective? I, I would just take a, a couple things. I think um, this past week, if, if I just look at what we did, we had a, a group in uh, looking at a bilateral investment treaty, sat down with their counterparts in the uh, the various ministries and the government of India had two very, very good days of discussion. Um, that will be a big step forward as we move through that. It's not going to get headlines. It's not the Siv Luke deal. Uh, but it is a very steady piece that would underpin some of the business relationships that Ambassador Rao talked about. We had Secretary Panetta, and obviously this is any time you have a cabinet member, it is a very good thing. But it's also become rather routine in Delhi. Um, to have uh, senior American officials come to meet with their counterparts, to have discussions that went literally around the world for both Senator Clinton and um, or Secretary Clinton and Secretary Panetta uh, in their discussions with the Prime Minister, with their counterparts. Um, so I think there is a, a, a vibrant dialogue going. I think people that expected India and the United States to be in lockstep probably don't have any appreciation of the independence of either of us, um, that we are going to pursue our 
our interests, our policies, but the consultations that go into that, the ability to say, um, we agree on these things, we agree on this goal, we're going to take a slightly different tactic. Uh, I think that piece is um, increasingly done without acrimony, it's done with routinely. Uh, there is a transparency. We had a, a very, very good discussion of, of Afghanistan after 2014 so that uh, there was an, a better appreciation among Indian leaders of where the United States strategy is going on the military front, uh, where we are looking at the international community pieces. So I think those are there. Um, we have both been very public in saying that we share a goal in Iran. Um, some disagreement on how you get there, but both very pleased, I think, that negotiations are going on and a recognition that the sanctions have played a role in that. Ambassador Rao, would you, would you agree um, that there's harmony, at least on the goals with regard to Iran, and are the paths uh, very divergent uh, or just divergent on certain elements? I don't see any, any fundamental divergences. You know, there are always uh, nuanced approaches that each of us may take to a particular issue. Now, if you take the issue of Iran, I think we've been very clear in India about where we stand on the whole nuclear issue concerning Iran. And uh, we have, in fact, worked together with other members of the International Atomic Energy Agency, including the United States, uh, to not only to express our positions on this issue, but also uh, to set the tone and the direction about what needs to be done. So there are no fundamental divergences of approach. And I would, wouldn't say uh, that there are divergences in, or were divergences in respect to other uh, important um, situations concerning our immediate region or, in fact, West Asia, for instance. Uh, you know, India has expressed its position in an independent manner, but that independence has not signified a certain, uh, you know, fundamental resistance to what uh, our other partners are saying. We've been working together, cooperating in the United Nations, in the Security Council. Our permanent representatives remain in constant touch. And today, it's a reflection of the maturity and the, the candor and the transparency that describes the dialogue that we are able to sit down, discuss differences where they exist or dissonances in, in approach, and uh, to see how we can build uh, more common ground on, on difficult issues. I think there's also a, a, a respect on both of our sides to look at the number of voices that are involved in both of our countries um, and to respect that debate internally that um, certainly the, the press, the think tanks, the speakers in the Indian parliament uh, have no hesitation in uh, disclaiming on uh, a variety of foreign policy issues. I think Ambassador Rao does the same thing, trying to watch Congress and the papers and uh, various groups uh, like this uh, in, in the United States. And there's no end of that debate, which I think is very healthy in both countries. You both mentioned uh, the security relationship and Secretary Panetta's uh, trip this past week. Uh, what is, is there a takeaway from his visit? Uh, how would you frame U.S.-India security uh, cooperation going forward? What are the big Threats. What are the big opportunities, I guess, in, in the discussion? I think I can lead off since I was there uh, this week with a number of things that I think were highlighted by the Secretary, by uh, Minister Antony, uh, by the Prime Minister, the National Security Advisor. One is just how much broader our relationship is in the military. Uh, we've had 50-some exercises with the Indian military, um, in some of them incredibly complex. Um, they will allow us uh, both to respond better to crises like tsunamis and cyclones that, that happen with some regularity in South Asia. We also have a, uh, an understanding and a, a look at the world around us and to see where uh, we can work together on military issues. Uh, defense trade is an increasing part of our relationship. Uh, I think the Secretary's announcement that he's going to ask Deputy Secretary Carter to take a look at our own regulations is a, a very important piece looking forward. Um, the Indians are also an, engaged in a defensive strategic review right now that will soon be finished, and I think we can take a look at that. Um, there are uh, additional exercises planned. Uh, certainly, 
Afghanistan and the desire to have India continue its training program of security forces from Afghanistan in India was uh, encouraged by the Secretary. I believe that the next dimension to this defense and security relationship will also cover research and innovation and co-development, which, uh, which is an area that, uh, that is recognized by both governments as, uh, as important for the future of the relationship. And, uh, and as Ambassador Powell mentioned, our whole cooperation in the field of uh, dealing with um, threats like piracy or counter-terrorism -terror or or the security of sea lanes of communication. All these form part and parcel of uh, you know, defense and security interaction and dialogue today, uh, apart from the military to military exercises that we have. And, um, and I believe that uh, you know, given India's uh, position, strategic position astride the Indian Ocean and the kind of experience and the kind of uh, and the kind of background that we bring to this whole narrative of cooperation is recognized as valuable by our American friends and partners. Let me move off of security and uh, to the economy, because I know that's uh, uh, of interest uh, to both countries. And, and both countries are frankly facing tough economic uh, times, obviously here at home, but also growth projections in India have been revised uh, downward, I guess, in the mid five percents, which frankly we would take, but um, that's, <laughs> it, it is down from where, <clears throat> where India has been. Um, I guess Ambassador Rao, how is India uh, coping uh, with the slowdown? Is it, is it simply a product of the global uh, slowdown or is something else structural happening? And could it spur the government to push through some of the kind of much anticipated or called for uh, reforms? I believe that the government of India is very clear and very committed to continuing and strengthening the process of reform and liberalization. I don't think there is any uh, doubt on that score. And it's something on which I believe a large number of um, uh, political parties in India also uh, see no difference on. You know, there is the issue of building consensus within a coalition, within a political coalition, on taking the reform forward. In, 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 in a sense, what I mean is the pace of reform. Mm -hmm. But I believe nobody is raising fundamental issues about what reform is about and whether it needs to be taken forward. I don't believe there is any, any real doubt or questioning of, of the fundamental need for opening up and reform. Yes, the, the rate of GDP growth has fallen, and it, the factors of the external global economic situation, what is happening in Europe, definitely have an impact on, on uh, the, the internal uh, economic growth of, of uh, an economy as big as India's, which is so tied to the rest of the world in terms of trade, in terms of investment. Flows of capital have definitely slowed down. Of course, within the country, we've had problems of inflation supply side uh, bottlenecks, which we are addressing. In fact, the Prime Minister just took a meeting a few days ago on which uh, decisions were taken on moving forward faster on major infrastructure projects, whether it's on road or rail or ports or, mm -hmm. or airports, and how uh, all the ministries of the government need to work together to remove any bottlenecks that exist. Mm -hmm. But the message that we want to give to our friends, um, including those here in the United States, is that, that India wants to do business with the rest of the world, would like investment coming in from inside, uh, from outside at a faster pace, and uh, that we are, uh, we are very, very focused on the infrastructural needs uh, of the economy in order that we remove any bottlenecks that, that have existed and uh, to promote the goal of inclusive economic growth, considering that there are large numbers of people who still live in poverty and whose needs must be addressed first and foremost. Ambassador Powell, what, what do you say to U.S. investors who must be talking to you, uh, not only now, but as you were going through the process of preparing to go to India, and as you hear, I'm sure, um, a variety of things about the investment climate, um, should U.S. investors be confident? Should they be um, bearish, bullish, cautious? What's, <laughs> what's the right framework? And uh, do you see a potential for some of the, the 
uh, investment limitations to be expanded in the future. I, I will admit to having been primarily in listening mode, uh, <laughs> but one of the impressive things as I look back over these last six, seven weeks is just how many senior representatives of American companies have been through my office. Um, many of them describing additional things that they intend to do in India, uh, some com complaining or asking for advice on dealing with a particular problem that they have encountered in a, a situation that they're already in. Uh, that's pretty normal with a trade relationship as big as ours, that there are going to be difficulties, there are going to be some, some concerns. I think uh, the Vodafone case, uh, some other additional tax measures have been a, um, pretty much across the board concern to, for the companies that have come in, whether or not uh, a deal uh, can be looked at retroactively or not, which is what, how the American companies look at this. Uh, decision. That's been the key uh, piece that they've looked at. Uh, there is certainly a lot of debate in the press and, and uh, spurred on uh, by companies in America who are looking for additional opportunities, particularly in the insurance sector and the pension sector, uh, to provide investment. And that has been one of the areas where the government has indicated that it's uh, looking at reforms that, that might come uh, relatively soon. I'm reminded of being a four or five year old and being able to walk down a block to the grocery store around the, the corner in my Iowa town. My mother could pay the bill later and I would bring home whatever it was. And then the supermarket came at the edge of the city and then there was a huge debate when Walmart wanted to be out on the highway. Um, there's a little bit of that writ large in India on multi-brand retail. Um, the debate um, has not spent a lot of time on what the benefits would be, and I think this is one area where we're trying to look at how the embassy might in, help inform some of that debate about what uh, the advantages would be in terms of cold chain uh, storage, some of the other uh, benefits both to the producers and to the consumers alike. Uh, but recognizing that this was an emotional debate in the, in the United States at various times uh, right. as well, and that uh, these are political as well as economic issues that have to have a, a following in a democracy. And so trying to create that support. But Ambassador Rao, I, it's one thing to have kind of caps and limitations on foreign direct investment. There is a bit of a separate, I guess, concerning undercurrent in the investment community, and that's the safety and security of investments because of either tax decisions or IP protections. Do you sense that there is that kind of discomfort now in the investment community about the safety and security of investments in India? You know, we maintain a very healthy dialogue with representatives of the U.S. business community doing business in India, and also our companies that exist uh, here that do business here that, uh, in fact, are present here in very large numbers, as you are aware. And uh, the very uh, reality, the fact that there is so much two-way business and investment um, interaction and uh, linkages between India and the United States is testimony to the fact that, uh, you know, the business community regards, you know, these business ties as, as very good business propositions. People are making profits. People are um, uh, seeing that the climate in India is transparent. There is a rule. There is the rule of law, and uh, and there is the possibility always to engage in close contact and interaction with you know the authorities in order to address the questions that may arise as uh, you do business. The idea, of course, is not to make India tax haven. Our finance minister said that very clearly. There are certain you know, uh, internationally accepted practices in this regard. Uh, and India is not, not out of conformity with any of these internationally accepted rules and regulations. And I think that is something that, uh, that we want to say again and again uh, to our friends and our business partners from all across, uh, across the world. And, and let me say that if you look at the reality uh, of the way the business ties have grown in the last few years, I think this is evidence enough of the fact that uh, this area of the relationship is going to be a very dynamic and very progressive sector for our ties. Now, another common feature both countries share is not only economic problems, but political gridlock. And um, you just have to look 
here, for example, in the United States, it took three years to come up with a model bit, a bilateral investment treaty, just the language of what a bit would say. And export re control reform on the Hill seems to be um, uh, a tough thing to get through. And similarly, in Delhi, the parliament has been tough on some, as you mentioned, um, on some of the reforms. We have the same kind of debates about civil liability uh, protection for the nuclear industry. So. Given this political gridlock, does it make your jobs, how does it make your jobs <laughs> more difficult? And is this a relationship sh that should transcend that kind of partisan politics? In my view, this relationship is transcending partisan politics. I, I just wanted to refer to the fact that one of our major opposition leaders, Mr. Yashwan Sinha, was here a few days ago, and he spoke at, to several audiences here in Washington. And what came through, the messaging that came through very clearly is that on the issue of the India-US relationship, there is consensus, there is the belief on both sides of the political spectrum or various sides of the political spectrum in India that this is a relationship that needs to, to, be, uh, to be strengthened and will, in fact, progress as, uh, as we move forward into the future. So there, are, there is no, really no, as I said, fundamental disagreement about that. I would just add a, a slightly different tack, and I think I'm, Ambassador Rao is doing the same thing I am, is that uh, one of the things you do is get out of the capital. And uh, we're looking at how the American Embassy and its structure of the four consulates can reach out to, to more cities. There are 45 cities in India that have at least a million people in them. Uh, we're only located in five of them. So how do we work with that? How do we work with the state governments that are particularly forward-leaning in attracting foreign investment of wanting to use innovation um, and a variety of things. So uh, one of our efforts is to, to look at these other opportunities. I'm, I'm struck. There was certainly a, a tension between the center and the states when I was there in the mid-90s. It's not, it's not a brand new phenomenon in either of our countries. Uh, but the uh, current political alignment in India has put much more uh, emphasis on the states. There's also an enormous latitude and differences among the states as to how they handle uh, business development and the welcome that they give to foreign investors. So uh, looking with the FICI and CII and others at how you take best practices from those states and from those foreign companies and, and try to uh, work in other states where there may be additional opportunities that haven't been identified. Let me, let me ask one more question, then we'll open it up to the audience. And um, I wish Nero was here to uh, ask you this question, because it, it really is about um, your role as uh, kind of breaking through and, and firsts and trailblazers, and as uh, female ambassadors from two of the kind of global powers. Um, and whether you feel kind of that does that create a special obligation or added um, set of responsibilities for both of you to reach out to women and girls and say that you too can be an ambassador, a prime minister, or <laughs> secretary of state, or, or even a, a president one day? Well, um, as Ambassador Powell just mentioned, uh, you know, going outside the capital and you know being active. Uh, all across the country. Uh, that's what I've also tried to do in these nine months. And I've tried to interact especially with younger audiences, with youth, and that includes young women and young men also in universities. Uh, and, and I've found this enormous interest not only in, uh, in the role of a woman as a diplomat or as, a, you know, as an administrator, but also about curiosity about what I represent, mm -hmm. the country I come from. And, and uh, so it is this inherent um, spirit of an inquiry and curiosity and intellectual curiosity about India that I'm enormously encouraged by wherever I go and wherever I speak. I, I think many of you know, um, unlike Ambassador Rao, I actually am the first American woman ambassador to India. And I find that a little astonishing, frankly, <laughs> that we've waited this long. But I'm delighted to be, uh, be there and to have this role. Um, I think it's given me a little bit more entree into some of the women's groups specifically. I've um, had uh, dinner with winter women entrepreneurs last uh, Tuesday, a week ago, Tuesday in, in Hyderabad, that probably a male ambassador would not have sat down with quite such an exclusive group, but it was fascinating to hear their stories 
and to see the changes that have occurred in India in terms of the, the ceilings that have been broken in India since I was there in the 90s and the particularly younger women that are emerging in uh, non-traditional roles in politics and a variety of places that uh, are really very, very encouraging to see. I think there are you know, obviously still places in both of our countries where uh, women uh, feel that there are additional opportunities that are needed. Uh, certainly providing education for women in both of our countries is incredibly important, uh, ensuring that trafficking and other uh, abuses of women uh, can be addressed. But there is a very active campaign in India now on those issues. There's a, a lot of debate, and uh, I'm encouraged by it. Um, I find as well with the younger audience, I'm learning to use my thumbs. Um, <laughs> the uh, ability to use social media now in India is quite incredible and to reach a much larger audience, uh, particularly via the cell phones. Um, it's uh, a very big opportunity uh, on some of these issues as well. Yes, in fact, on the issue of social media, I find that the use of such uh, tools as Twitter, for instance, they're very useful in reaching out to young audiences particularly. And I see the instant nature of the response that you receive uh, just with those short messages that you're able to transmit about, you know, some activity that, you know, uh, you've been involved with or some meeting or That's some right. visit. In fact, we may get questions via Twitter uh, okay. <laughs> here. So we'll, you're exactly right on. <laughs> It's very hard for all of us diplomats to do 144 characters. Yeah. <laughs> but I always say we were the generation brought up on writing telegrams, and we tended to keep them as brief. You know, I mean, not not the diplomatic telegrams. I mean, telegrams as you know, Actual you know, wire right. wirings sure. for money, or sure. <laughs> you know, saying oh, you're sick or something like that. You make it as brief as possible. So one uses that. Uh, experience, I think, to write a tweet also. Right, right. <laughs> Why don't we um, open up the floor to, to questions? And I think we have to be um, uh, rather expeditious here. And um, questions should be questions and not statements. And if you could identify yourself and your organization, we'll try to take a couple from the press first. Thank you very much, Prabhu Virgo, India Globe in Asia today. Uh, it's to be great with the two great ambassadors from the U.S. and India, great largest democracies and richest democracies. My question is that, uh, is this ambassador slow down in India, or is this because of the lack of energy? Because energy is the key for any progress for any country. And as far as we're talking about people pe to people, that's what the Indians in India are asking, what happened to this uh, civil nuclear agreement signed years ago between the two, uh, Obama, President Obama and Prime Minister Singh. When India is going to get energy, and finally, is this also because of uh, fear from China and also terrorism in the region? Thank you. <laughs> well, that's, three that's, three part question. Yeah, that's <laughs> like a multi pronged exactly. uh, question. But um, uh, I wanted to say that on civil nuclear energy, uh, this is very much in focus. Uh, the the cooperation between the two countries. Uh, the uh, U.S. companies concerned have been in discussion with the Nuclear Power Corporation of India Limited, and in the last few months, we've seen, um, you know, developments, positive developments in that in that context. So, uh, to answer your question briefly, uh, yes, energy is important, and uh, civil nuclear energy, of course, is one important aspect. But there are there is also cooperation in other fields of energy in non-conventional sources, renewable sources of energy, uh, take wind energy, take solar energy, take building efficiency, uh, looking at how we can improve technologies, uh, clean coal, uh, you know, how we, uh, how we make our growth more, uh, you know, low carbon. I think in all these areas, energy does figure in the discourse. So that is one aspect. Now, um, I don't, you said something about China and uh, terrorism. Rising China in the region is also uh, many concern in India. 
you know, I, I don't see this relationship between India and the United States in that sort of construct that, you know, we are working together because we have something to do against some other country. That is certainly not the way I think grown-up democracies work with each other. So we have so much happening bilaterally. There is so much of a logic, so much of a, of a relevance, and so much of a need for us to work together on so many, so many issues in so many areas. And uh, China, of course, is an important neighbor for India, a very important neighbor. And uh, we have a relationship with, with China. Uh, uh, you know, a, a bilateral relationship as well as cooperation on, on many multilateral issues that has been transacted in, in, a, in a mutually beneficial manner. Uh, in any relationship, there has to be mutual sensitivity to each other's concerns, and we have stressed that as far as our dialogue with China goes also. And the U.S. on, the, on its own, looking at the U.S., the, U the U.S. has a very, very important and substantive relationship with China also. Counterterrorism is, is part of our strategic dialogue. In fact, the launch of the Homeland Security Dialogue and the Counterterrorism Initiative have been at the forefront of our bilateral dialogue in the last uh, few months, in fact, in, in the last, uh, since the launch of our strategic dialogue, in fact. Mm -hmm. I think I would just add to this that um, Many of the interests that India and the United States have, China has as well in promoting the ability of trade of, of um, you know, standards and ways of doing business that uh, would lead to all of us having a, a prosperous future. So I don't think it has to be a, a competition. Um, certainly looking at both of us um, with China as important trading partners, there are ways for us to work together, all three of us, um, that, that exist on that. I would echo Ambassador Rao's words on the counterterrorism. Uh, we both face serious threats, um, and uh, the work that we're doing together is, is designed to help reduce those threats. Let's see where we are. Right here. Actually, I was pointing to this gentleman right here with the glasses on. <laughs> Hi, thank you very much to you both. Uh, Kerry Byron with Interpress. I was just wondering if you could briefly touch on how you foresee Iran being discussed in the official talks next week. Thanks. The, um, there will be a, a, a review in terms of uh, the next steps in the, the dialogue with the P5 plus one uh, that we'll meet in, I believe it's Moscow, uh, at the end of next, or the following week. And I think looking at that, um, assessing where those talks are going. Um, Iranian visitors recently in Delhi, so uh, I'm sure that the foreign minister will be um, briefing on those. Uh, we've already had discussions in Delhi, and I think Ambassador Rao's probably briefed here. Uh, so it will be along those lines. Let's see. Hands, hands, hands. Let's go in the back. I can't see who's back there. I'm Stanley Kober. Um, in the past few days, there's been a meeting in, Shang in Beijing of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And the subject of Afghanistan came up. It was addressed by India's external affairs minister in a speech yesterday. Um, the most important security challenge we face today relates to Afghanistan, he said. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization provides a promising alternative regional platform to discuss the rapidly changing Afghan situation. And I wonder if Ambassador Rao could explain more what India sees in the SEO as an alternative regional security platform for Afghanistan. Well, I would see the, um, the uh, work of the SCO uh, as very relevant uh, to uh, the situation in our region, whether it concerns Afghanistan or whether it concerns cooperation on a number of issues, whether counterterrorism or energy security or better trade and transportation links. So the SCO really looks at many of these sectors of cooperation. Um, when it comes to Afghanistan, I think um, within the SCO and all of us who are 
either observers uh, at the SEO meetings or actual members. We have a stake, I believe, in, in, the, uh, in peace, in stability, in progress, and uh, prosperity within Afghanistan. And if countries in the region, and all of us belong to the region, uh, and those of us who attend the SEO meetings or those of us who are members, can work together to uh, strengthen and consolidate trends of uh, peace and security in Afghanistan, I think it would, it would be good not only for our immediate neighborhood, but also for, for everybody else who is concerned about the situation in Afghanistan. Yes, Afghanistan does represent a security challenge to all of us in the region. There has been a history of turbulence, of instability, of violence, and terrorism in that country. And uh, we have, all of us who are, who are concerned stakeholders and who have, uh, who have, uh, uh, have, have an interest in seeing a peaceful Afghanistan would not like to see any regression or reversion to the situation as it obtained in that country before 2001. And that is, I think, the context that the external affairs minister, mm -hmm. Mr. Krishna, was referring to in his remarks. Right here in the front, in the red. <clears throat> uh, Seema Sirohi, FirstPost.com and Gateway House. Uh, my question is to Ambassador Powell. Um, India has reduced its uh, oil imports from Iran um, to a large extent. Is it your sense that there won't be any sanctions? Uh, is India going to get a waiver? Because mm -hmm. as you go into this uh, dialogue, there's this sword of Democles hanging over uh, India. My second question is about Afghanistan. Uh, now the US is very keen that India should train uh, Afghan forces, et cetera. Uh, but just a couple of years ago, US was adamantly opposed to the idea. And uh, just want to know what changed in the meantime. Let me take the, the question on Iran uh, sanctions first. I think uh, there should be decisions this month. As you know, the deadline is at the end of the month, and I'm anticipating that those will be out. Um, we've very carefully documented in cooperation with the, the government of India using a variety of sources on, on what the statistics are, and so I think that that decision is pending. You don't, should, you don't want to make any news here. I don't. Right? So, yeah. <laughs> and, and I'm not the decider. <laughs> so. um, on the, the training, I think there's a recognition that uh, the Afghan security forces uh, can benefit from training inside uh, India. This is being done in a variety of, of different ways with both the police and the, the uh, officers. And so uh, I think there was a recognition of the benefit of this and a, a desire to diversify the training that the Afghans were receiving. Uh, the Indians uh, made that offer. Uh, so I, I don't think it's a significant, huge decision. There, there's been a variety of efforts over on the training, uh, but very much appreciated by Afghanistan and by the, the uh, international forces that are in Afghanistan in, in terms of the contribution that's being made to strengthening the ANSF. Let's go right here in the middle. I'm Vijayendra Kumar, and I'm in business. Uh, when UPA2 came into power, there are high expectations that many of the economic reforms would be enacted and that the growth rate trajectory of India would be 9% or above. Now, with Mamta Banerjee exercising a veto, virtual veto on uh, economic liberalization, do you think there's any chance or any hope that in the remaining term of the UPA2 that economic reforms would be enacted? I think we addressed this question earlier. Uh, but I want to say that um, I don't think uh, there is any cause uh, to abandon confidence or faith or optimism about India, in short. But I guess, Ambassador, you, the evidence does show a dip in uh, U.S. investments into India, and, it, and I don't know if that carries through internationally. And so with the concern being that the walls are not being kind of taken down for international investments, and I think that may be part of the kind of recurring concern in the investment community. And I, and I know I heard what you said about people should be confident, but 
what are what should they be confident of, about in the coming well, year? Well, on the so. institutional investments, we've an announced a series of policy measures in the last few months about, you know, about how we would like to increase the flow and provide the confidence that is required to institutional investors. And on FDI, you know, the doors have always been open. The U.S. is one of the major investors, but there are a number of other countries in fact, that have made uh, even larger quantums of in foreign direct investment in India. Uh, so we would certainly like to see FDI from the U.S. increase. And uh, as I said, you know, this is something that we really want to see happening, particularly in the critical infrastructure sector. And you know, the 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 announcements that were made a few days ago about how we want to uh, to ease and uh, remove any perceived barriers that exist in this field. Uh, it's very, very clear that this is the government's intention, and we are definitely keen on moving ahead and intent to intend to, to do that, definitely. Can I, if I can just add, I think the, the vigorous debate that goes on almost daily in the press uh, during the parliamentary session that just ended not too long ago, um, these ideas are not dead. Uh, there is opposition to them, uh, most certainly, and uh, from a variety of sources. But there are also people putting out from the business community, the international community, from within the government. Uh, the Planning Commission deputy chairman this week uh, described a window and some things that he hoped would happen between the presidential elections and the fall state elections that, that take place. Uh, there are a variety of people who are looking for ways. There's been suggestions that the downturn in the rupee, the, the drop in the, in the growth rate might be uh, a justification for some of these. It, it is a very, very vibrant debate. It is certainly not uh, something that has been shelved completely among the Indian politics. Uh, I know from the American business community that while there are concerns, there are also people that are still looking very much for opportunities. And so I think there's a, a dynamic going on there that um, isn't always visible from here. I think we have time for one more question. And then what we're going to do is the ambassadors have, uh, I think, a, a little bit of time to, to stay around. And we have some refreshments. And um, so if you don't get your question. If I may just sure. add one uh, small point. I think the story of Indian investment in this country also uh, must, be, yes. must be heard, uh, because that has certainly been a very visible uh, phenomenon on the on the whole you know in the whole arena of business interaction between the two countries That's and right. it amounts to close to 25 to 26 billion US dollars of investment from Indian companies in the US economy in the last couple of years and that's projected to increase from yes all exactly okay. okay last one so let's go in the in the back you've been patient Thank you. I'm Keiichiro Nakazawa. I represent JICA, Japan International Cooperation Agency. We have provided a lot of assistance to Indian infrastructure projects, such as you know, metros in Delhi, uh, Chennai, uh, Kolkata, and uh, Bangalore. Uh, my question to Ambassador Rao is again about uh, Afghanistan. Uh, you know, given the concerns you have about the stability of Afghanistan, you know, what kind of role you know, Indian government would like to play, not only in training the Afghan forces, but also development of Afghanistan? I also would like to ask you, what kind of role you would like the American government to play after 2014 of withdrawal of the uh, combating troops? Well, as far as um, the Indian uh, approach to Afghanistan is concerned, I'd, you know, I'd like to borrow a term that uh, my friend Ashley Tellis used a few years ago, invest and endure. That is really uh, the approach that we have actually internalized when it comes uh, to Afghanistan. And uh, the factor of Afghanistan's development is very much a primary goal or primary concern for India. The investments that we have made, the commitments in development cooperation that we have made in the last few years uh, are evidence of that. I don't want to go into, into more details about it, but it's there for the world to see. This is apart from the security cooperation. And the strategic partnership document, the declaration, the agreement that we concluded, India and Afghanistan, last fall, 
uh, encompasses all these areas together. So it's, it's uh, the best guide, in fact, an indicator uh, about the level of cooperation that we have with Afghanistan and that we intend to undertake with Afghanistan. I want to add that, of course, between India and Japan, you referred to the Japanese um, uh, investments, the Japanese uh, cooperation in the field of development and infrastructure creation in India. We, we, we deeply appreciate that, and I think you know any visit uh, to India uh, would indicate to you uh, how uh, how we uh, have so positively responded uh, to to our cooperation uh, with Japan, to Japanese cooperation with us. As far as the U.S. role in Afghanistan is concerned, post 2014. Uh, of course, we, we have seen that uh, there are definite indications of a drawdown in the U.S. presence in Afghanistan. That is a reality that uh, Afghanistan has to deal with and the region has also to, uh, to, uh, to uh, deal with and to see what, what uh, needs to be done in order to secure the situation in Afghanistan as, and, as I said, to uh, prevent any possibility of um, the, the, an upsurge of violence and terrorism and the and the reappearance of elements like the Taliban who had caused so much grief and and, uh, and destruction for that country in years gone by so um, we are in close touch of course with uh, the US government we consult with the, each other very very regularly about the situation in Afghanistan and how we can work together all of us in the region uh, to strengthen Afghanistan's capacity to deal with forces that, that are anti-progress and uh, do not um, want peace or stability in Afghanistan. So we have to all work together to strengthen Afghanistan's capacity to deal with forces that threaten its progress and prosperity. Ambassador Rao, Ambassador Powell, why don't I um, uh, take this opportunity on behalf of the Center for American Progress to thank you for for being here. And we, we wish you well in the strategic dialogue uh, next week. Um, I think we are optimistic about the future and, and put in a plug for the paper that Michael Wirtz and I uh, put out, but, the, but the, it does strike a more positive tone and less, less hand-wringing. Um, but we, you're welcome back here at any time, and we, we thank you and wish you well in the, in the months ahead. And, and again, there are refreshments here, so I hope you can stay and join us. Thank you. Thank you.